It's time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. A presentation of the Longine Whitnor Watch Company, maker of Longine, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longine. Good evening, this is Frank Knight. May I introduce our co-editors for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope? Larry Lasseur from the CBS television news staff and John Oates from the editorial board of the New York Times. Our distinguished guest for this evening is the Honorable Harold E. Stassen, Director of the Foreign Operations Administration. How many persons in the executive branch of government have a bigger or more controversial job than a director of foreign aid? But even this year, an economy-minded Congress cut only 3% from the vast appropriation he asked for, three and a half billion dollars in foreign aid. Mr. Stassen, how long do you think the taxpayers of America will have to bear this burden of money aid to our allies overseas? I think it will continue to reduce, but in some degree it is be necessary as long as there is a grave Soviet threat in the world. Well now, uh, Mr. Stassen, several senators have been saying that uh, the present bill can be cut by 50 percent or so because of previous unallocated appropriations. I'm sure there's an answer to that. Would you tell us what it is? Uh, yes, the previous unexpended appropriations are committed to the building up of jet air forces in various countries, and it takes a long time to build them. If we decide today in this Congress to help establish jet squadrons in Spain, it'll probably be four years before that money is spent. And that's why there's always a big carryover of unexpended and, in many instances, unobligated money. So suggesting that $2 billion or so is simply waiting to be spent isn't quite an accurate picture. No, it's a matter of the what we call the lead time, the time it takes from the, when you plan with Congress until you finally get the forces in being or the technicians uh, established in overseas areas. Well, Mr. Stassen, how do you know it's doing any good? Uh, now, your fellow Republican... Clarence Brown of Ohio has said that uh, since 1940, we've given over, I think, $50 billion to our friends overseas, and we've got fewer friends now and more enemies than we ever had before. Is this true? <coughs> no, it's not true, of course. Uh, take, for example, uh, the situation of Germany and Japan to begin with. Uh, they were not exactly friends uh, 10 years ago, but the people are very friendly and uh, building strength together at the present time. And of course, there are disagreements and there are criticisms at times from other countries. That's a part of freedom. Mm -hmm. uh, we do not have the uh, forced uh, agreement of the Soviet area, but actually there's a lot of friendship around the world to the United States. In that connection, I'd like to ask you what you think of the policy that's sometimes advanced of using our economic strength to influence the internal uh, political policies of the countries that are recipients of our aid, such as Land, forcing land reform in Italy through our economic aid or tax reform in France, that type of thing. Well, you can, should not try to force internal conditions Persuade. for that. <coughs> it's a matter of persuasion, that's right. It's a matter of how will the aid money be used and uh, how can it be effective. And in that uh, respect, uh, land reform, uh, better wages for workers, uh, greater productivity, uh, a freer exchange of goods between the countries of Europe, for example, uh, those are a part of the way in which the free world can be stronger and the conditions of living be better, and therefore, in turn, uh, communism have less chance. Mr. Stassen has been quite a hassle in Congress over some of the projected riders which have been attached to the foreign aid bill, and one of them, I believe now, Senator Nolan's, is rather vague, but it does uh, say, in effect, as I read it, that uh, the uh, president would... Uh, have the right to reconsider our membership in the United Nations if Red China were admitted in the coming fiscal year. Now, do you think he should sign the bill with such a rider attached? The rider doesn't really go that far as it's now presented in the committee. It uh, indicates that uh, if that eventuality should occur, that the president should immediately consult with Congress, indicating it's a very grave situation. But I feel that in its present wording, I would recommend that the president sign the program which would include that rider. Well, how about the rider that uh, goes along that would cut off possible aid to uh, Italy and France if they jo don't join the uh, European Army, EDC? Well, those, those riders I do not consider a desirable process. 
but uh, that one too is in form such that uh, we can carry on uh, with it. And therefore, when you consider the alternative of either reaching an agreement with Congress uh, or of not having a program, clearly I would recommend the President uh, approve the bill and go forward with the program. Do you think that type of writer would have any actual effect in persuading the French or the Italians to join EDC any more quickly? No, in my judgment, you do not get results by uh, laying down ultimatums when you're working with friends. Would that I think that uh, it's a matter, rather, of uh, <coughs> persuasion. Would that and apply to the other writer, too, Mr. Stassen, the one that uh, forbids us to give any help to any nation that signs a Locarno-type treaty in the Far East, which would, might mean Britain in case Britain entered such an well, agreement? That, uh, that writer, again, uh, in its present form, uh, uh, we can work the program with it, and uh, it is an expression of uh, congressional intent. And so uh, we accept it that way. Be correct to say but you're I not happy about it. Well, I'd rather be correct to say that it's been uh, my own observation, not only in this present work, but uh, through life, that if you're working with friends, you get farther by persuasion, <coughs> by talking things through, than you do by trying to give ultimatums. Well, speaking of friends, Mr. Stassen, a lot of people in this country do believe that if we stayed home and just traded in our own hemisphere, we'd be better off than giving money to people who don't agree with us many times and who possibly may not fight for us. Now, do you think we could afford to stay home and save our money? Uh, by no means. That I if you did that, what you would tend to do is increase the danger that the communists <coughs> would take over uh, Western Europe, uh, take over the Near East with all the tremendous oil reserves there, uh, take over in uh, Africa, are in the Far East, and if you let that go on for a few decades, then you really face a rather gloomy outlook for America and the Western Hemisphere. In other words, you feel it's an actually a must that we must expend this money in order to keep communism from gobbling up these countries abroad? Well, Larry, here we are with uh, about one-third of the world's total production of goods and services. We have a tremendous position of leadership in the world, and that <coughs> carries with it a responsibility and unless we exercise that leadership, we abdicate. And when we abdicate, we do it at our own peril. Now, you have been attacked, of course, by a former political associate of yours, with whom you certainly are no longer associated, named Mr. McCarthy, for uh, encouraging what he calls the blood trade between America's allies and the enemy, meaning, of course, trade between the free world and the, and the Iron Curtain, or Eastern co uh, country. Uh, would you care to comment on, on this question of east-west trade or free, unfree trade? Yes, I feel that uh, unless you're to <coughs> conclude that a third world war is inevitable with all of its horrors, and unless you take that, that hopeless attitude, uh, then you must look for the way in which there's a chance of developing a peaceful world relationship over a period of years. And so that uh, when the other free nations say, we want to trade in non-strategic, non-war, non-armament goods, in consumer goods and consumer <coughs> manufacturing goods, then I say that is a desirable process. Well, in other words, that there, there's a chance that you move mm -hmm. the whole Soviet area and its people and the pressure of its people toward peace instead of war. Well, to go a step further, do you think it would uh, be wise to offer the uh, communist countries some alternative to direct aggression? Do you think that if we offer to trade with them with in non-strategic goods that uh, we might uh, soften them up in the future and make them less aggressive? That's right. In other words, I think that the, the basic policy that Secretary Dulles has enunciated is right. You must keep before the communists the alternatives, that if they are aggressive, uh, if they are belligerent, they will be met firmly and with great force. If they will move toward peace, toward living uh, peacefully with the rest of the world, uh, then there is an opportunity for expanded trade and for uh, uh, peaceful relations. Well, nevertheless, you said recently... Those alternatives always have to be there. I said you said recently that our trade with Russia was the lowest uh, it's ever been. Yes, in uh, 1953, uh, in the uh, atmosphere of the Korean War picture, uh, the total trade was lower than ever before. But on this question of uh, strategic or non-strategic trade, uh, do you uh, feel that are we in agreement in the first place with our allies on, non on what constitutes non-strategic trade? Uh, uh, not entirely. There are different views of it. It's hard to know just where to draw the line. We'll say everybody will agree that uh, 
a powder puff or a pound of butter is uh, to be classed non-strategic, and everybody agrees that all kinds of guns and heavy machinery are strategic, then you come in between. What about a heavy farm tractor? Is that strategic or non-strategic? Is that sort of thing still under negotiation? That's then? right. Uh, well, we are making headway, and uh, we've talked just this last weekend with the uh, mm -hmm. president of the British Port Board of Trade. Matter of fact, I'm uh, going to Paris uh, tomorrow, Sunday rather, uh, to carry on the talks on Eastern. But does your trade. bill hold any possibilities of switching trade from one region to another, say, taking it away from Indochina and sending more to Latin America, where we've recently had some real the trouble aid? on our hands? Yes, the program presented uh, to Congress uh, has flexible authority on the part of the president, so that if greater needs arise, like in Latin America, he can transfer some funds from one area to the other. That flexibility has proved uh, very successful in the past. That's, in fact, the way in which he carried on the East German food package. You remember when the yes. riots occurred? Yes. And we moved in immediately with food packages. That was done under that uh, transfer power to meet a sudden emergency and meet it effectively. Well, we still have a little time, sir. I'd like to ask you one question. Just what do you think would happen if we did stop all this aid and saved our money again? I think you'd immediately increase the danger of a, another Great Depression in America and of a Third World War. In other words, after World War II, after World War I, we didn't do anything like this. We didn't have a program in relationship to foreign countries. We pulled back, and in a single generation, we had the worst depression in our history, and we got World War II. I feel that following effective leadership in these economic and security matters and the humanitarian approach of technical cooperation gives the best prospect of economic success at home and security for the United States in the world. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Stassen, for your very candid comments. The opinions expressed on the Longines Chronoscope were those of the speaker. The editorial board for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope was Larry Lasseur and John Oakes. Our distinguished guest was the Honorable Harold E. Stassen, Director of the Foreign Operations Administration. A Longines watch is one of the most perfectly functioning mechanisms made by man. Now, on first acquaintance, one is astonished by its day-to-day -day performance. As months pass into years, its qualities of great accuracy and reliability become truly priceless. These persuasive words are backed by fact. In competition with the finest watches of all the world, Longines watches have won highest honors. Ten World's Fair grand prizes and 28 gold medals are some of these honors. For greater accuracy, Longines watches have won countless honors from the great government observatories. Honors, too, in sports, aviation, and in science. Now, in a watch, the best costs but little more than the least. Longines watches do not carry a prohibitive price tag. You may choose from many beautiful models, both for ladies and gentlemen, for as little as $71.50. Now, if your present watch is not what it should be, or if you are planning to buy a watch as an important gift, these are facts to remember. Longines, the world's most honored watch, the world's most honored gift, premier product, of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company since 1866, maker of watches of the highest character. We invite you to join us every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday evening at this same time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, broadcast on behalf of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines. This is Frank Knight. Reminding you that Longines and Whitnor watches are sold and serviced from coast to coast by more than 4,000 leading jewelers who proudly display this emblem, Agency for Longines Whitnor Watches.